All right. Um, so I will close this one as well. Um, so the purpose uh, is to show you how to uh, design and simulate a photonic integrated circuit for quantum key distribution application. Um, so Francesco already gave a nice introduction uh, about quantum cryptography. Um, so this is just to summarize a few, few concepts. So the purpose here is to transmit a cryptographic key so that it can't be intercepted. So we want it to be secure. And if it, if it, if it is intercepted, then the recipient is alerted. Uh, the key is encoded in qubits, which are quantum qubits. And anytime someone attempts to read one of these qubits, the information is lost uh, because it's being detected and uh, the receiver is alerted. And the shared key can only be used once. So these are the, some of the main principles to keep in mind. Now, why do we want to uh, create a circuit for quantum key distribution in integrated photonics? Um, but it's a bit similar to like if you look at other applications, uh, the advantages uh, are similar. So you can have a high miniaturization. You don't need bulk optics, uh, big, uh, you don't need to create something that is physically very big. Uh, you can uh, mass manufacture these circuits. Uh, this also means that you can achieve a lower fabrication cost. And there is already existing uh, technology uh, that uses integrated photonics, such as uh, telecom. And so you, then you can integrate this type of systems with this uh, telecom infrastructure, for example. Um, so what we're going to see today uh, is uh, the circuit that you see here in the picture. So this is a, a quantum key distribution transceiver. Uh, it's made up of uh, two parts. Uh, the first circuit that you see here is a transmitter. Uh, this is built in an indium phosphide platform. And this is not the part we're going to focus on today. Um, what we're going to focus on is the uh, receiver. Uh, so this receiver is built in silicon nitride platform. Uh, this is in order to minimize the losses as much as possible. As I think someone already mentioned in the questions, it's important to uh, not lose too many photons. Um, okay, so that was the transmitter. This is the receiver which we're focusing on today. Uh, this circuit is taken from this paper, uh, which I linked here. So I believe normally you should get the slides after the training. So uh, you can uh, go and have a look uh, more in details. Um, so let's have a closer look at the QKD receiver. So this receiver is made of different parts. Uh, the most important building block is here are the Maxander interferometers. There, there are a lot of Maxander interferometers used in, uh, in different ways. Um, so first of, first of all, uh, we have the first MZI, which is a tunable beam splitter. This is uh, used for a different protocol than what we are going to use today, um, which is called um, coherent one-way protocol. Uh, what we are going to see today is a protocol called differential phase shift. And um, basically, uh, this protocol is based on uh, sending a coherent pulse train that is phase modulated. So we make a distinction between a zero uh, phase shift and a pi phase shift. So keep that in mind. The second MZI is a loss balancing MZI, and uh, this is used uh, in order to balance the losses in the two arms of the next circuit. Um, this you're also going to understand a bit better later on. And the most important part of the circuit is this asymmetric MZI, where one arm has a time delay line. Let's uh, dig into, deep, into this a bit deeper. So, um, in the end, we want to achieve this, this circuit, like we want to design this circuit ourselves. So this is what we are going to achieve at the end after we've written all the code using our uh, IFKIS photonics design platform. And, and what we send in as an input is uh, the signal and as an output is what we are going to, to achieve. So let's, what do we need in order to achieve this? So what's important is to have in our, first of all, a structural flow and file organization. So you have a circuit with a lot of components and which is um, has different levels of complexity. Um, and especially what's really important is that the components are designed in a way that they perform in the way you expected it. So we want to keep a tight link between layout and simulation uh, where we can predict 
uh, how this layout is going to behave when we measure it. We want to maintain parametricity in layout and simulation so that when you want to change uh, some parameters in your circuit, you don't have to redesign it from scratch, but you can easily tune them. And we need simulation test benches. Um, all right. Um, okay. So maybe before having a look at how to do this exactly, I'll give a brief introduction about our company and our design platform. Uh, so Lucida Photonics uh, is now a company that is eight years old. We recently celebrated our birthday. We are headquartered in Belgium and we have offices in Belgium and China. And our mission is to help photonic IC designers enjoy the same first time right experience as electronic IC designers. So we bring automation and expertise in the photonics uh, design flow. And uh, we want to help you basically get your circuits fabricated right the first time. Um, so the way we do this is with the IPKIS Photonics Design Platform, where we uh, bring together in the same flow different aspects, uh, different steps of the design flow. So from component design, circuit design, and design validation, then you can easily uh, switch between these steps, uh, go back and forth in your flow, thanks to our single central component definition. So um, maybe a bit more in details uh, for the component design. Uh, for the whole flow, we leverage uh, Python. So our platform is based on Python coding. So we leverage one standard language, uh, which you can combine also with your own uh, scripts. Uh, like you can combine IPKIS with other Python packages. Um, we rely on parametric components in layout and simulation. Uh, you can visualize future fabrication so that you are always sure that you are designing on the correct layers of the technology that you're using. Um, you can run physical simulations either with our built-in uh, EME solver or linking with your favorite uh, physical simulation tools such as Lumerical, for example. Um, and then you lay out your components, simulated your components, then you want to place them together in a circuit, uh, as we are going to do today uh, for this uh, QKD uh, receiver. Uh, and so after you place everything together in a circuit, you run uh, circuit simulations using the cafe engine, which we are going to do today. And even at circuit level, we are keeping a tight link between layout and simulation. So if anything changes in your circuit layout, the simulation is also adapted automatically. And uh, the same thing accounts for the parametricity. Um, and so finally, you can then export your GDS uh, so that you can plan it for fabrication, run post layout, validation of your circuits using CAFE, extract netlist, uh, and so on. Um, so uh, going back to our design, so how do we design and simulate this? Um, let's have a look. So first of all, um, we need to input a pulse train into the, into the circuit. So if you look here, uh, this is our input. Um, this usually comes from a QKD transmitter, as here we are not designing that, uh, we simulate uh, the signal that would come from the QKD transmitter. So this uh, train of pulses contains the information of the quantum key, and in the protocol that we are using, uh, these pulses are all have equal amplitude, as you can see, um, and uh, the phase difference between the different pulses can either be zero or pi. Um, and the quantum key is encoded in the phase difference between the different pulses. Um, all right. Um, okay, now that we have our input signal, uh, let's have a look at this building block starting from the asymmetric MZI with a time delay. So here is where the most interesting part of the physics occurs. Um, we have two arms. Uh, the bottom arm is a straight wave bed section, and then the top one is an arm with a time delay line. Uh, after the light goes through the two different arms, they interfere at the output directional coupler. And if the uh, pulses have the same phase, uh, then they will go to the top, they will be um, detected by the top photo detector. And if they have opposite phase by the bottom photo detector. Um, in the time delay arm, we have several tunable MZIs uh, so that we can configure a time delay. Um, so that we can choose uh, through how many spirals uh, the light goes through. And so we, we are tuning the time delay. So you can either 
assuming each spiral has the same length. Uh, in our case, it will be something like two centimeters for a time delay of 300 picosecond. Then we can configure this to have uh, from one to seven times the time delay. So you can have from one times 300 to seven times 300 uh, time delay. Um, in the straight wave guide, we have um, a thermo, thermo optic phase shifter, which is ensured, used to ensure that the phase difference between uh, the two pulses remains the same at the output end of the MZI. Um, let's have a closer look at the time delay arm. It's actually quite interesting. Um, so there are four MZIs in this arm, which are used uh, to decide whether the light will go, uh, let's say, through the straight wave guide or will pass through these spirals. So we want to be able to control uh, how many spirals the light goes through. Um, so if we have a, a closer look at uh, the MZI that is located here, and the same would be in the other locations, um, we have a 50-50 directional coupler. Uh, then we have two separate arms, uh, one of which uh, has a heater, and, uh, and then the arms are recombined with another 50-50 directional coupler. Now, uh, the light will come in from the bottom and then it will be split equally between the two arms. Now, assume that there is no delay between the two arms. Uh, so we will ensure that the path length is exactly the same. Then the light will recombine here. Um, where do you think the light will go? To the top or to the bottom output? So will it be cross or will it be a bar? You can, it's nice if you, you can just type something in the chat if you want, just take a guess. I'm going to guess top. All right. Oh, both. somebody says both here. Sujai says, bo um, Sujai says both in the chat. All right. Um, so the light will need to go to the top. Uh, as you are introducing a pi divided by two phase shift here, and then another one here, so the light will go across. Uh, so basically when you have a zero, so let's say when you apply minimal voltage to this arm, just enough to make sure that the two arms have the same path length, uh, which is our logical zero, then the light will go up. Uh, now, same question, and I think now the answer is easy. Uh, if there is a pi phase shift, Five phase difference between the two arms. So we apply a certain higher voltage to make sure that we achieve a pi phase difference. Then well, where will the light go? Uh, it's relatively easy, I think, because it's just the opposite. So it will go to the bottom. Uh, and, and so the spiral will be avoided. So what we are doing with the circuit uh, is that we can control the number of spirals the light passes through by tuning each MZI. Uh, so assume the situation, uh, you have uh, one on each of the MZIs, so you're applying a certain high voltage on each of the MZ MZIs. So in this case, the light will go through in each of these MZIs and you have zero spirals. So the light just goes through the straight wave guide. Now, let's say we want to, the light to go through one spiral. Okay, so in, on the first MZI, uh, we have a logical zero the light will go cross, so it will go through the spiral, arrive at the second MZI, and we want it to go cross again, to go back into the straight wave guide. Otherwise, it will go through the other two spirals as well. So we apply again a logical zero, it will go down, and then uh, we want it to stay in the straight wave guide. And so here we apply a one, and here we apply one. Uh, and this way, we the light went only through one spiral. Um, for two spirals, we want to avoid the first one, and let the light go through uh, these two spirals, which are grouped together. So we apply first a one, so it goes uh, through, and then a zero, so it goes cross, and then at the output again a zero, so it goes back to the straight wave guide, and then a one, and so on and so on. And uh, this is actually very easy to control through code. And so that's kind of the advantage of having a, a code-based approach to design. You can create just a matrix uh, with all the possible combinations. Uh, of the delays that you can apply. And then you can say, if I take the zeroth uh, line of this, of this matrix, uh, then 
which is this one, then it goes to zero spirals. The first line, this one, then it goes through one spiral and so on. So if I say uh, five in here, I know it will go through five spirals. So it's very easy to control um, our time delay line this way. All right. Um, now uh, we have established, we have seen how this time delay line works. And um, then we said the signals we recombine at the output uh, directional coupler. Um, okay, I see there is a question, maybe I will already, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think fair replied only to me, yeah. Uh, yeah, the length is indeed determined by the system requirements. I determined the bit rate. Um, in this case, uh, we took the uh, values that we use for this example, we took them from the paper uh, that I referenced, uh, where the bit rate use is around 580 picoseconds. And so each spiral has a time delay of 300 picoseconds. So that if you use two spiral, you can match uh, the bit rate. Um, so, um, so I was saying, you, we have the pulses that uh, interfere at the output directional coupler. Uh, what happens if uh, they have different amplitude? Uh, then you will achieve incomplete interference between the two pulses. And instead of having the pulses having uh, going only to the top or only to the bottom, they will be detected by both photodetectors simultaneously. Um, so this has to be avoided. This is due to the fact that obviously the top arm will have higher losses because the path length is higher. The bottom one, we have lower losses. And so we have to find a way to balance this. How do we avoid this? Um, so this is why we have a loss balancing MZI, which is placed before uh, this uh, asymmetric MZI. So the goal of this MZI is to uh, basically make sure that uh, the uh, pulses at the end of the asymmetric MZI have same amplitude. So the uh, voltage on this arm, on this heater, on the bottom arm will be uh, calculated uh, so that uh, at the end of the asymmetric MZI, the pulses have same amplitude. And this way we are balancing uh, um, the am amplitude at the output. And then finally, uh, and this will be very quick, the tunable beam splitter. So as I mentioned, it is only used for the coherent one-way protocol, which is a different uh, protocol than the one we are using today. It's a protocol that it does not use um, um, it does not use phase modulated signal, but amplitude mod modulated, um, and we are not. It's not something we are going to get into today. Uh, but so this is the reason why it is placed in the circuit, and so the reason why you will see it uh, also in the layout. Um, so. In IPKIS, uh, the way you can actually create this circuit uh, is usually, like anytime you design something, you will usually start from a foundry PDK because eventually you want to get your circuits fabricated. And then of course, uh, you will also have your own custom components, especially when you're designing a more complex circuit like this, you will need to create components that are specific to the circuit that you want to be able to control yourself or that you can see fabricate in the, your foundry of choice. So imagine you want to tip out with cornerstone um, in the silicon nitride platform, then you will use the cornerstone founder PDK and you will build your own library on top of this PDK. Um, for this specific tutorial, we are using uh, what we call the Cypher PDK, which is a demonstration PDK. So it's uh, equivalent to a real PDK such as the one from cornerstone, uh, but we develop it for these training purposes. And then we have um, what we call a photonic steam library. So it could be your own library where we created extra components based on these building blocks. Um, so again, this is the circuit we want to achieve. Um, and we took a few building blocks from a Cypher PDK. First of all, we need uh, a silicon nitride waveguide. Uh, here you see the cross section. Um, we need directional couplers. Uh, for our max under interferometers. Uh, this is a directional coupler that has been designed and optimized and placed in the PDK. So the foundry is providing this to you, uh, ready to use. And we have a heated waveguide, which we also need to use for the uh, heated arm of our max under interferometer. Now using these basic building blocks, now we want to actually create our max under interferometer 
and we want to um, design the uh, tunable delay line. And this we do in our photonic steam library, which is built on top of the PDK. And in case you can use all these different um, uh, blocks from different libraries uh, together in the same design. Um, so we have designed this Max Zander interferometer uh, with the directional coupler at the input. And the, so this is a directional coupler from SciFab, and this is the heater from uh, SciFab. And we place these building blocks together to create this circuit. And then the tunable delay line is actually using the MZIs um, and then the spirals, and then creating spirals in order to uh, create these, uh, this circuit. And so the question is, how do we put all these components together in order to achieve our finalized circuit? So the way you do this in IPKIS is by using the concept of I3.circuit. So I3 stands for IPKIS, and uh, this is a, um, a concept which is predefined uh, in IPKIS itself, uh, and that allows you to define uh, a circuit in let's say, a relatively easy way. So to start, one of the most important parts is defining properties. Uh, so this is, this is what makes your circuit parametric. So whatever you put here, these are parameters of your circuit that you can change afterwards. So say distances between different components um, or parameters that you actually pass to the subcomponents themselves, um, things like this. Um, then we have uh, the next section in our circuit definition is uh, the instances. So the instances is just a list of all the subcomponents of our circuit. Um, now, as you can see here, I'm not getting into the details as this is um, more like a demo session, uh, not an in-depth and hands-on training. So I, I'm trying to keep it a bit, uh, I, I'm trying to explain the uh, most important concepts so that you understand the logic. Um, and as I will also show later, all the code that we use for this circuit is actually freely available on the SID Academy. So you can have a look and use it afterwards and run this code on your computer. Um, so as I was saying, the instances contains a list of all the subcomponents of our circuit. So uh, for example, the MZI will be an instance, the tunable delay line will be an instance. Um, and that's probably it. Uh, some uh, grating couplers, uh, bond pads uh, for the uh, for the um, uh, electrical connections and so on. Uh, in the specifications, we define placement and connectivity. So once we have listed all the components that we want in our circuit, we have to tell IPKIS where we want to place them and how we connect them to each other. Um, so for instance, uh, which type of waveguides, with which type of algorithm, Will it be Manhattan? Will it be um, just a, a waveguide uh, like S bands uh, and uh, and so on? Like, what is the band radius we want to use for our connections and so on? And then finally, we define what are the exposed ports. Uh, so, what is what are the ports that we use to connect this circuit to the outside world? And how do we talk to this circuit? Um, and so. If you, if you have a deeper look at the circuit, then you will see um, basically all these uh, different steps that are shown. So you, you have the MZI uh, here that is uh, from the Cypher PDK, and this MZI was placed inside the circuit together with other MZIs and connected together using the uh, specifications in a three dot circuit. Uh, here, the MZI is connecting to uh, spirals, and then there will be other MZIs afterwards. Uh, and so we are taking all these subcomponents and connecting them together. Um, so as you see, this receiver does not have yet optical connections to couplers or electrical connection to bond pads. This we do in a separate class, which is uh, called routed receiver, where the most important part to understand is that we define this uh, concept of device under test. So this will be your receiver class. So what you're taking is, what you're doing is you're taking your receiver uh, as a block and you say, you place it in another circuit and you say, okay, now route it to the outside. And you, you define what grating couplers you want to use, what bond pads you want to use. But the concept is whatever you give to this routed receiver class, it will be routed. It doesn't matter how many optical ports you have. It doesn't matter how many electrical ports you have. All the connections are semi-automated automated, so it will, it will happen in a semi-automatic way. 
uh, let's see more in, in detail. So uh, before I show you a little bit the code of how the semi-automated routing is done, um, I'd like to explain, to show you a few concepts of uh, connector synecdoches. So the way we perform all these uh, connections, both inside the receiver and also to route the receiver to electrical and optical inputs and outputs is using built-in connectors in Ipkis. For example, we have uh, the Connect Manhattan connector, which is, can be used for waveguides and for electrical wires, uh, where you just define, you, you specify what is your start port, what is your end port. Uh, you can specify control points. Uh, you can specify what is the minimum straight section you want for your waveguide. You can specify a rounding algorithm. Uh, you can use predefined algorithms from IPKIS that we provide, or you can define your own. So you can use any Python library to write your own algorithm and then uh, pass it to IPKIS. You can uh, also define the band radius. And then what you get is something like this. So this was our start port. This was our end port. And we told IPKIS, please connect it with the Manhattan connector. So uh, only perpendicular sections, so horizontal and vertical through this control point with a band radius of 20 micrometers. Voilà, done. Um, and similarly, we can use connect band, which is a generic band. The approach is the same. You just define input uh, start and end port, band radius around an algorithm. Uh, it can be used for waveguides. And uh, the concept is the same, just that you, you immediately see that um, the path uh, the coordinates through which the waveguide goes through um, are clearly uh, different compared to the Manhattan, uh, Manhattan case. Um, and these are calculated automatically uh, by this connect band um, that is defined in each case. Um, so this being said, uh, so how is the semi-automated routing approach uh, defined? So uh, basically you, you're leveraging uh, the power of coding because you use for loops and you, you run for loops on your electrical ports in this case. So here we are looking at the electrical routing. So without looking in detail at the code, uh, you can see that no matter the number of electrical ports, uh, you will go through the full list and you will create connections for each of them. And the code defined here uh, automates uh, this, uh, this action. And then similarly, um, it adapts not only to the number of ports, but also to the location of the ports. And the, similarly, we do this for the optical ports. So you don't have to tell the circuit how many optical ports you have. Uh, these are extracted from your device under test uh, in these lines of code. And then the for loop is run on all these optical uh, input and output ports. Uh, this way you have full parameter control. So anytime you change your receiver circuit, the routing uh, is also adapted. Um, all right, so now that we have, maybe before moving on, I will go a little bit in uh, briefly in demo mode. Uh, I see also there are some messages in the chat. I'm not sure if there are questions. Uh, uh, there's an optical loss question from Armand. Yeah. Uh, what about optical losses in the circuit waveguide? Um, I see that Ethereum replied. Uh, okay, you just replied. But indeed, now, yeah. yeah, so the, um, uh, the waveguides are defined in the PDK, in this case, SciFab, and they have uh, there is data in the PDK, uh, which uh, is used in the model for the waveguide. So, uh, as Ethereum said, they're based on a loss per uh, meter value. And so uh, when you run circuit simulations, uh, IPKIS will know how long the waveguide is and what is the loss of that waveguide based on this value that is provided in the PDK. Um, thank you. Okay, so, so if you're on, we have um, all the material that I'm showing you here is a part of the Lucid Academy project. Uh, and so if we go in uh, training, then topical training and quantum key distribution, uh, there are a couple of scripts that you can run. The first one, uh, most simple one is a, a example receiver.py. So we are first uh, instantiating our receiver circuit. So without uh, routing to the outside world and we are uh, exporting to GDS. And, uh, and then we are 
instantiating the routed receiver and writing that to GDS as well. Um, so if we run this script, then what we obtain are, uh, this is the, the pure receiver uh, already exported to GTS. Uh, so you can see that these already, but you wouldn't send this to a foundry because it doesn't have dressing couplers of one pads, but these are already type of file that you can send for fabrication. And then you can inspect your layout. Uh, and then we can also have a look at uh, the other, the receiver routed. So then, and then you see that, uh, I can close this one. Okay, my carry out is complaining a bit. So I just reopen everything. Uh, you will see that the receiver routed has exactly the same circuit as the receiver, uh, but now with electrical and optical connections. So you see the main circuit is the same, but now we have, uh, here we have ed edge couplers. Um, and then we have uh, at the bottom, uh, we have connections. Uh, we are biasing the heater arms of the MZ, heated arms of the MZ dies by connecting them to bone pads. Um, <clears throat> okay, and so now that we have our layout is ready, what, what we actually want to do is simulate this circuit. Um, so I go back in presentation mode. So the first thing we want to do is um, define constants uh, for biasing and simulation. So there are a few things that we, be, that we define externally, like for instance, the bit rate uh, that is determined by the protocol that we're using. And those we define at the beginning. Then we um, have, we use this bias receiver function that we have defined in our test bench, uh, which automatically calculates the voltage to maximize the self-coupling in the max under interferometer switches. Uh, that we have in our circuit. And it automatically calculates the voltage that we need uh, for the loss balancing and the die. And then finally, once we have these, uh, these values calculated, we can uh, use them to uh, simulate the receiver uh, using CAFE, uh, using the calculated voltages. So let's have a deeper look. Um, we have a few, here a few constants defined for biasing and simulation. Uh, so he, here we have a bit rate. Um, so the time distance between our pulses here, pulses here is 581.4 picosecond. This comes uh, from the protocol that we are using. And it was taken from the paper that I linked before. Um, and then we use two delays. So that what this means is our light is going to pass through two spirals. Each spiral has a delay of 300 picoseconds. So we have a total of 600. Uh, so it's the closest we can get to this uh, bit rate. Uh, now, um, our bias receiver function uh, has a number of parameters we can pass. Uh, for instance, center wavelength is a parameter that you can change. The number of delays is taken from uh, the list that I showed before. And then here for all these voltages that we can uh, apply to our circuit, we provide a value of none. So what this means is that we don't provide any and we tell this function, please cut please calculate it yourself. Um, if we provide an actual value, then the calculation will not be done uh, in the background, but it will just use that fixed value that we provide. Um, and finally, we simulate the receiver. Um, so let's actually have a look um, in, in actual code, which is more interesting. Um, so if I now run this script, Uh, all right, so you see the first function that we use is this bias receiver. So we provide none as arguments. Uh, so um, what our function is going to do is automatically calculate uh, what is the, you know, what is the switch voltage. Uh, so we calculate the voltage for maximum self-coupling in the MZI switches. And then, uh, so this is the MZI that we are going to use. So we are first visualizing it. 
Um, the first time this can take some time because it's uh, running optimizations in the background. Uh, for those of you that are maybe already a bit familiar with ITKIS or with Python, you can actually uh, have a look at the function itself and how all this is defined. So there is no, uh, let's say, it's, it's not magic. Uh, you know, you can actually have a look at the code and see how it's done. And if you think you can do it differently or better, you can always change the code and in, improve it. Um, so this is the optimization of the voltage on the die switch. So you see it to be around 1.6, uh, what we want to apply. So actually, for now that we know that this is our optimized voltage value, then what we can do next time we run the script is we just copy paste it here so that the optimization is not run again, and next time it will be faster. Um, and maybe while the simulation is running, I can show you that then this is uh, at, the, at the end when we run the simulation and then we plot it, this is what we achieve. Uh, so what's going on here? Um, so as we said, we are looking at the phase difference between two subsequent pulses. So our pulses uh, all have same amplitude, so that's good, uh, and the input, and then uh, but you see that the phase is changing. And so we have a phase of pi, and then the next pulse has a phase of zero. Uh, so there is destructive interference, and so the light is going to the bottom photodetector. Then for the next pulses, uh, we have the same uh, a phase difference of zero. Uh, so the light is going to go to the top photo detector, and so on and so on. And this way we are uh, uh, splitting the light between the, the, two, the two outputs. Um, so this I'm going to show you later. So now let's see uh, how the simulation is going. So now what we are doing is we are calculating, uh, we, we just calculated what is the uh, voltage that we need in order um, to balance the power levels after the delay. Uh, so we know now it's 1.0434. So I'm also going to copy paste that here. Um, now we are calculating um, the required voltage on the thermo optic phase shifters so that uh, the signals can interfere properly. In the meantime, I don't know if there are any questions. Uh, no, at the moment, there are, no, there are yeah. no, none in the chat screen at the moment. Okay. Unless um, people have audible questions. If any of you have installed IPKIS um, and have managed to open the Lucid Academy project, you can also try to run the scripts. Um, so you, you can look, see here uh, the path where I am. So you should have exactly the same. Um, so if you, if we have a look, for example, at how the receiver was defined. Uh, so we use the i circuit class that I was mentioning before. Um, here you can have a look at uh, all the components that we are using. And if you, in PyCharm, if you, click, if you press control and then click on the class, then you can see, you can jump to where this was defined. So this GMZI was defined in the PTIN library, um, or for instance, the directional copper was defined in Scifab. And what you do is you import all of these components at the beginning of your file so that you can then use them inside your circuit. And then you can see, so here's where we define our instances, so a list of our components. And then you can see here we define the specifications on where to place these components. We can place the first one at the origin and then the other ones relative to the first one. So that we, every, if we move the first uh, component, everything else in the circuit moves with it. And then we can define Manhattan connections between all the different uh, instances uh, in a list. So you're basically saying all these couple of ports need to be connected the same. So you just provide a list and call connect Manhattan only once. Um, and that's it. And then uh, here we are defining um, our exposed ports. 
Uh, and then the next class router receiver is where um, the, the algorithm for the same automated routing is provided. Um, so going back to our receiver, so now we actually have uh, a voltage uh, for the thermoactive phase shifter and for the CDS. And now we are just waiting for the final simulation. So we calculated the performance of the receiver for the DPS protocol. And well, this is um, the same simulation that I was showing in the, in the presentation. Um, all right, so I see there is a message, okay. Um, now, maybe as a fun exercise uh, to, to see what happens when our circuit is not operating correctly, um, you can open the simulate receiver.py file and, uh, you know, we calculated the optimized voltage for our loss balancing MZI. Uh, what happens if uh, the optical output uh, is uh, what happens if we use a non-optimal voltage so that then the uh, the amplitude of the signals that interfere on the output directional coupler are not the same. Um, so let's try that and have a look. Um, so here our optimum voltage is 1.0434. So let's try for instance uh, 0 0.7. Um, so I'm running a simulation, but I already did that before, so I'm going to show you the result directly, so we don't have to wait for it. Uh, so what happens is that you have uh, non-optimum uh, interference, so um, you don't have perfect interference anymore, and you have some signal going to the uh, wrong photodetector. Um, well, that, that basically sums it up. Um, so by changing all these voltage values, uh, uh, basically you can also explore the physics uh, behind the circuit because uh, you can, uh, you're, we, are, we are going here from uh, designing a directional coupler, for instance, you run simulations to design a directional coupler and optimizing it uh, to using this in a broader circuit, but you can still access the physics of uh, all these subcomponents and play with it and see what happens to your circuit and then really explore uh, how your circuit works. Um, all right. So basically this sums up a uh, bit the EPKIS approach uh, to designing the circuit. Um, so what we did is we use components from the PDK and from the uh, PTIM library SciFab so that you have full freedom of designing your own components and using also components from an existing PDK. Uh, and we use uh, key IPKIS features in order to uh, create the circuit and simulate the circuit. So we use then iterative circuit and Manhattan connectors uh, for the wave gas and electrical wires. And we use connect components concept to create a test bench where we put together um, a different components logically. Um, as I was mentioning earlier, this tutorial is available on Lucida Academy. Uh, on the website, you can find a quantum key distribution tutorial, which contains an explanation of what you've seen today. Uh, and so you can find text that you can reread and go through these concepts. Uh, this is freely available. Um, normally, all of you should have received an IPKIS license uh, and IPKIS installation. If you have not, uh, you can contact us uh, so that we can provide you one so that after this training, you, uh, you can try this tutorial on your own. Uh, we will be happy to provide you with a free evaluation license. Uh, here there is also a link uh, to the tutorial online. Um, and basically that's it, I think. Uh, 